We have a full morning, so we'll go ahead and get started. And anybody that comes in late will be able to catch the recording if they'd like to. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation on workshopping queries, linked data, vocabularies, and ethical cataloging. Linked data, also called Web 3.0, is the practice of structuring information in a way that both computers and humans can easily under understand, and it holds revolutionizing potential and implications for libraries, archives, and museums. As institu institutions from state universities to the National Library of Medicine and the Library of Congress rush to implement and define it, questions of representation and lim limitations are too often ignored. Avoidance of these questions in Web 1.0 and 2.0 had and continue to have dismaying effects. Rather than allow history to repeat itself, minoritized groups have staged an intervention into these new technologies, offering a variety of options for alternative representation and organization. This workshop will offer tangible benefits to newcomers by introducing the work and purpose of linked data, but it will also offer alternative approaches and strategies useful for experts. The presenters who serve on the board of the International LGBTQ plus linked data vocabulary Homosaurus will offer a wide range of applications drawing from their work in archives and digital humanities and biomedical informatics. After an introduction, we will discuss use cases for the Homosaurus in GLAMS, including platforms such as Omeka, Scalar, and Mark, as well as biomedical research. Next, we will showcase accessing the Homosaurus through the GSSO, Gender, Sex, and Sexual Orientation Ontology, and using it for natural language processing tasks such as text detection, document classification, and tagging. Finally, we will demonstrate practical uses to link data by tagging documents available in Medline, as well as material from the AIDS History Project collection at UCSF. Throughout, the presenters will discuss around shifting terms and identities, both in the context of clinical medicine and queer history. Our presenters are Claire Cronk, who is a PhD candidate in biomedical informatics at the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine, and Brian Watson, who is a PhD student at University of British Columbia's School of Library, Archival, and Information Studies, and the directory of histsex.org. Both Claire and Brian are on the board of Homosaurus. I am Amanda Ross, coordinator of monograph copy cataloging at Texas A&M University. I am co-facilitating with Eric Pennington, the computer support specialist for information resources at Texas A&M. During the session, please use the Q&A to ask questions. After the session, continue the conversation on the Slack channel. Hashtag LD underscore 2020 underscore ethics underscore track. And with that, I will hand it over to our presenters. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, I would love to be um, sitting in Texas eating tacos with you all, but unfortunately, that is not going to happen. But I want to say thank you for Amanda and Eric and Michelle um, for putting up, organizing with this. I'd like to thank for all the organizers for putting such a violent effort to make this happen despite everything. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, I'm Brian Watson. I use any pronouns. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of British Columbia School of Library Archival and Information Studies. I research our ethical cataloging, digital archives, and queer nomenclature. And I'm joined by Claire Conk, and she'll introduce us a little bit later. Um, originally, uh, we let's start with this basic question what are we doing here, and what's happening? So, this is an overview of our general path for this workshop. Um, we'll begin to introduction link data. We've got 90 minutes scheduled. We might honestly not use all of that time um, because we'll have to leave some time at the end of the discussion. So if you do have to duck out an hour, you decide to have enough in your face, don't worry, no hard feelings. Um, this workshop was originally intended as like a friendly hands-on introduction to the concepts of ethical cataloging, link data, ontology, and so on. So there's a lot of goodness there. 
But if you're in old hand link data um, made salty by tough battles in XML, um, then the beginning of this presentation might seem a little bit boring to you. But hang in there. Um, there's always to try to save the best for last, and Claire's talk will be really impressive. Here's an overview of what we'll cover in the next half hour. This presentation has five parts: um, an introduction, which we're we're here now, and part two about the limits of cataloging and LCFH, um, and some solutions that have already been suggested. Part three introduces and explains linked data. And part four is where I'll talk about um, some digital archives and some approaches to this. And then we'll talk with, um, we'll turn to Claire's presentation, talk about the GSSO um, and natural language processing. Um, I just want to say that I am coming at this as a white person who of subtle heritage. I am, I am queer and I'm crippled, but I, and I'm not able to capture all the different varieties and intersections that, will, that might originate from this kind of work. So just to move on from there. Um, the presentation, this presentation in general, is the beginning is the one I see as a response to Emily Drabinsky's 2013 article, Queering the Catalog, Queer Theories and the Politics of Correction. This is a rather famous article. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I really recommend it. It's a fantastic introduction to some of the issues facing catalogers, the history of the radical cataloging movement, and queer theory in general. And I'll be touching on various parts of it. Um, but Doreen can give this backstory. The radical cataloging movement began in 1971 with Sandy Berman's Prejudices and Antipathies, which is pictured here. Um, if you're not familiar with radical cataloging, it's critically, re it's quote, critically reading subject headings for bias um, and arguing, often successfully, for changing the headings to ameliorate bias. If you're familiar, and if you're on Twitter, you might be familiar with the work of Violet Fox, and Hale Ganyan, and Mark Hold. Um, but as Dravinsky notes, this can be a losing game, um, and I don't think either Emily or I would disparage the work of radical catalogers today. It's still very necessary in the work that we live under. Um, and Crystal Vaughn here, a quote from Crystal Vaughn here, she agrees. She points out that reputation is fluid, but there's always be changes to language and to people's identities and the ways that they're expressing themselves. Um, for example, I personally use the term crimp, which is, no, not me confessing to being a gang. But it is short for cripple. It's a former slur that is being reclaimed by disabled people. It's an inclusive term, which represents all disabilities and argues for equal representation. Um, similarly, the word slut is being reclaimed by sex positive organizers. In some way, the word black is being reclaimed and used by a new generation of black activists. Uh, I have kind of like a kind of diagram of how this process generally works out. Um, in general groups um, in society have been usually named by people in authority um, with the power to name. Think historically rich white men, but now think like doctors or psychologists or sexologists. This term is then imported into large organization systems like Library of Congress, head circle subject headings, do decimal classification and so on. And then the hardworking and never faced enough cataloging staff apply those terms to books and other materials. And as free marches on, new identities come forth um, and these categories become emergent and they develop new communities and they receive recognition from catalog, the catalog changes and the whole process begins again. Um, so for Kordrinsky and for many other queer theorists, queer theory is not about who you are at the core. It's about what you do. Um, I can be a crip, I can be a boyfriend, partner, queer, gay, present as a very nice young man. But we all do this. We all present in different ways, different audiences. But it gets more problematic when you look at the story, um, identity, the history that changed so dramatically over time. Uh, one historian I love, yes, they had a famous phrase this as, there were no homosexuals in the 18th century because the term homosexual is such a modern identity. So queer theory cares, queer cares about what homosexuals or crips or sluts or black Americans do. All of that is to say that call numbers are taxonomies and taxonomies are not neutral. Um, if all of that is your jam, here are some really great reading um, areas, just uh, reading recommendations to start off on and help you help out with them more. But I think if you have any experience with library catalog, I don't think you need to see a very extensive bibliography to understand that subject headings have, and always have been problematic, racist, sexist, and colonialist. So there, what do we do? I mean, subject headings are still essential. Um, they, they remain important to researchers, they remain important to organizing information. And Taylor and Judry's recent um, research demonstrated this. It, demonstrating they took out all the subject headings in a catalog and they demonstrated that 
you would still lose a quarter to a third of all records. So we need to think of some solutions and we need to think of them in a more creative way. To advance our proposals, um, Emily Zeminski does offer one in that article. Um, she says, a queer approach to the problem of library classification and cataloging demands that these offensive subject headings and division of subject language remain uncorrected and librarians teach students how to read what they discover. This is a, a really interesting and provocative um, argument and solution. And I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with it, uh, but I do think it moves the burden from catalogers or from our responsibility to like change the institutions and the systems we work in to individual librarians. And it also will require the hiring of a lot more librarians to mediate uh, patrons' subject asset, patrons' experience with the catalog. So I don't, given um, all the higher increases and the waves of COVID and so on, I don't know if it's necessarily a possible or, or practical solution. But um, there are other proposals. Um, I'm going to stop with that key. Um, Melissa Adler um, and several other um, theorists around her proposed that we could use folksonomies. Um, right here, you have all the tags in. Um, uh, the folks folksonomy library thing for, um, I believe it's for transgender literature. And you can see all the different options here. Uh, and one of the advantages of folksonomies is that um, they let you, if you're, I mean, sorry, if you're familiar with hashtags on Tumblr or Facebook or Twitter, this is a similar kind of concept. But one of the advantages of them is that they're democratic. Anybody can define what that means. The disadvantage is that if you ever click on the wrong hashtag, it gets very confusing. And here's an example of that. Say, if I'm clicking on the example um, transsexualism, it brings up other related categories, which transsexual parents, um, transsexual operations, and uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. Cataloging was invented to solve this sort of problem when you have, and finds out that he wants to be a lesbian, transsexual works, lesbian, fair, weird, 11 slash zero. 11 on Henry, I don't know. Anyways, there's also another ma more major critique to the use of folksonomies. Um, as Patrick Kielke and some others spoke out, tagging and folksonomies are, quote, not free of oppressive forces. They're in not entirely democratic, actually. The terms used in non normative sexual subcultures or not other sexual subcultures that are not the norm do not relate in a top down or a bottom up fashion. This is to say that minorities creating folksonomies still live in societies with oppressions. They still cannot think their way or tag their way out of an oppressive society or um, world, I suppose. So this is going to turn us to linked data, which I would propose um, is a partial solution to some of the issues that, the, that I just outlined. And that's kind of what the rest of this presentation will be about. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, linked data has been called, um, as Amanda said, the next step in the internet, web 3.0, by none other than the inventor of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee himself. Um, and I won't go into a very long explanation of it because that's not the main aspect of this, but this right here is the graphic that if you've ever read an article about linked data, I'm sure you've seen this graphic. It, it lets, it's a practice of letting both computers and human understand what the phrase Bob is interested in the Mona Lisa means, or the Mona Lisa was created by Leonardo da Vinci. For um, humans, we know what, the, what a painting is. We know who Leonardo da Vinci is. We know, you might even know who Bob is. In, in linked data terms, this is called creating a subject, object, and predicate. And sorry, that should be right over here. So that's our subject, object, and predicate. Um, but a computer still would not know that. There, there are other, I think there's an easier way to, to, uh, to uh, explain linked data, and this is the one I often use. I can tweet out um, and say that I am presenting at Linked Data 2020 conference today. Great, and if you are reading, please feel free to tag me. But um, a computer doesn't know who I am. In fact, it doesn't even know why I should matter. But we do have systems of identification as a society. Um, so I can say Brian of Watson, born May 25th, 1989, in interest in New Hampshire, unseated Abenaki, Penacook Clan. I'm identified by the United States government, a social security number, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I can't give that to you unless you want to take out some credit cards to me. Um, I'm presenting at LD2020. Um, 
But when it's presenting, computers don't sit here and sweat, and you try not to mix computers and sweat. So we have dictionaries, which might, um, okay, so Ryan M. Watson, for Major for Nike, name in New Hampshire, blah, 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 is appearing nervously and formally before other people in order to show them slides and talk to them at an LD 2020 conference. What's an LD 2020 conference? I couldn't really even explain that to my mother. So um, let's try this. Brian, I watched it, Morgan, Nathan, 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 blah, blah, blah. Parent, obviously, no formal other people in order to show them slides and talk to them at LD 2020 conference. What library took place took place in Texas A&M, but even though from library 19, not big big help, Zoom, and so on. Um, so, okay, I can tweet this. Oh, wait, no, I can't. But. Twitter plan for this. It has at signs, it has hashtags, so we, we can do this. And that that is, again, subject, predicate, object. Grimlocks is presenting at LD2040 conference. So that's a very rough explanation of linked data. And if you're very familiar with linked data, you will no doubt have that, but that's kind of a, a, the loose way I have of presenting it. But how much source is the main reason for what we're here today. And I, I think this is a really useful way about thinking about and getting into the concept of ethical cataloging. I want you to think about what I just talked about, but bigger on a massive scale. How do we go from this to this? And yes, in case you're just wondering, Godzilla is gay culture right now. Um, and I hope you've all seen this absolutely adorable stop motion video of Godzilla's daughter coming out. Because um, if you're not, you should watch it after this. It's so sweet. Um, so, uh, the, I the wrong slide up in here, um, but I'm going to kind of go in a different direction. This is the Digital Transgender Archive, which is the technology that um, the Homer source um, enables to work. The Digital Transgender Archive is an online pub for digitized historical materials, for digital material and information throughout the world. It treats transgender as a practice rather than an identity category. And it brings together a trans historical and trans cultural collection of materials relating to trans and gender. Um, it has about 10,000 items up to the year 2000. Um, and just to remind you, if you remember Drabinsky here, this treating transgender as a practice, as in things you do rather than who you are, is partially, is, is generally what um, the Gender Transgender Archive is doing. So here's a neat, neat example. Um, I just Googled, just looked through Transgender Archive. And I found this scene. Um, it's collected at the Queer Zine Archive Project um, from 20, 2006. Each one of these terms here are clickable. Um, this is a, a zine at the Texas A&M University Zine Collection. Uh, so I can click into it and I can click on this term right here, sexual relationship. And it will show, um, I think I duplicated my slide there. It will bring up in the Digital Transgender Archive as the various types of um, terms and uh, items that fall under that um, subject heading. And clicking on that brings us to the actual item itself, which if you are a queer person, uh, to find out some of this information is essential because often it is very hard to find out sexual information. Or if in this case here, if you are an immigrant, it, this, this zine in particular does offer information for an immigrant who cannot necessarily access um, the health information that others are able to access. If you, your whole life, you've never seen yourself the center of a museum presentation or the center of an art catalog, what do you think it means to you to be able to go in a couple of clicks and get access to the resources you need? That is what the Homosaurus enables. The Homosaurus is the linked data vocabulary. Um, it's linked data control vocabulary. It's supported and built by the queer community. It was recently approved for use in MARC, so you can also use it in the older cataloging systems as well. Um, both Claire and I serve in the board of Homosaurus, and we're happy to talk a little bit more about it. Um, and if you are familiar with it, we can talk about ways that we can improve it as well. Um, community supported linked data vocabularies that originate from the community to describe are more useful because they can describe things that LCS cannot, like drag queens, which for some reason LCSH still refuses to add. Um, it, also, it also allows us to think in new ways about how we want to classify and categorize things. 
um, I made this point earlier, but if you've been told, as uh, like a friend of mine did, as soon as they came out, that you're going to die of AIDS and that's okay, your father and I don't want you here anymore. What does it mean to see older people's organization when you're homeless and you need access to information? What does it mean to just be one click away? So um, I'm going to turn it over to Claire now, but think about um, how seeing yourself representing the catalog for the first time, what it might mean to you. Thank you. Cool. All right, so um, Brian's going to continue to be operating the slides at that point, at this point, um, just to keep the turnover relatively low. Um, but hi, I'm Claire Cronk. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Um, I'm still getting used to this new laptop that, you know, quarantine and all that jazz. Um, but yeah, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine. I did my undergraduate at the University of Pittsburgh, hail to Pitt. Uh, <laughs> and I became interested in this project uh, essentially for a combination of um, my own experiences within the healthcare system and honestly seeing firsthand the, the failure of healthcare within the foster care system in terms of helping LGBTQ um, uh, children. And so, I want to just talk a little bit about how, if Brian, you want to go to the next slide? How we move from the linked data that Brian was um, speaking about to ontologies. Uh, next slide. So when we're organizing linked data, um, you have to put it into a structure. And as Brian talked about earlier, structures are inherently political. They're inherently ethical. You're taking a moral stance every time you organize data into a taxonomy or something. Um, and so when we do that, we have to be aware of these biases that we're creating. Now, from a computational perspective, the triples that we were talking about earlier, the subject, object, and predicate that relates the two to one another, those can be organized in a variety of formats. Um, RDF, JSON and OWL are probably the three most common to organize triples. They're very small files that can easily be sent. They can be used by any programming language on various platforms. It doesn't matter if you have a Mac or a PC or if you're running Linux. But you have to make sure that you're leveraging the computer readability with the human readability and keeping in mind the human component. And so oftentimes, in um, several different fields where you're creating these ontologies, people don't really immediately think, well, was this taxonomy ethical? And we have to like structure this larger picture of making sure that we can integrate things together. Now, one of my favorite problems that was introduced in one of my intro classes on ontologies was essentially, we have two ontologies and one says authors and the other one says creators is it fair to map those directly? And of course, some people will be like, well, let's say 98% of creators directly map to authors. We can manually go over all of them and see, well, only 2% include editors or translators or other types of creators or artists or et cetera. And you have this kind of feeling of, well, if it works for 98% of people, let's just do that. And when you're looking at things like uh, the EPIC healthcare system as an electronic um, health record, the choices tend to be very focused around, well, let's focus on the 98%, the bottom line, the profit. And so these higher structures, while making databases easier to search, making it easier for doctors to access their patient records, they kind of lock behind the, a paywall these features, such as like making sure that transgender or intersex patients are as well taken care of and um, given particular notice. Um, Brian, you can go to the next slide. Cool, okay, so real quickly, this is gonna be a real jump through some basic terminology. So Brian, you can go ahead and go to the next one. So all of these different structures kind of play into what an ontology is, but they're often confused with one another. So a vocabulary you can think of as like a free text field every single word that you can possibly think of, you can just type in there. But it is only limited by your imagination of words you can think of, but it is limited. Brian, you can go to the next slide. Um, in terms of a controlled vocabulary, you might have something like a spelling test where there are only so many words that are right, or a drop-down menu where you have to, or you're forced to choose any of certain options. 
Uh, controlled vocabularies are really useful because they make calculating statistical uh, analyses far easier and far faster. So if I want to know every single person who has asthma, uh, I could easily just type in asthma or give only a drop down versus a pretext, and that becomes a very simple database query. Of course, how do you classify somebody as asthmatic is a different story, but we'll get into that. Next slide. Uh, a taxonomy kind of builds on top of a controlled vocabulary. So when we think about classif classification of animals, you have larger and smaller um, designations of all of these several taxonomical units that various biologists say, okay, we can only use these. And you have the, the kingdom, phylum, class, whatever structure. Now a molecular biologist or a geneticist will show up and tell you, well, this isn't how things work in reality, but any bench biologist or biologist who's working in the wild will be like, well, this is what works functionally when we're in the field. Uh, Brian, you can go to the next slide. Now the Saurus um, steps back from the taxonomy and more towards the controlled vocabulary system. So we have these uh, all of a sudden relationships between these objects. The, the, we're forming predicates now between two. And these predicates are more than just bigger than, smaller than. And so you might have antonyms, synonyms, any of that sort of structure. But unlike a taxonomy, these are decentered. So they don't necessarily all connect to one another. Um, they're not all necessarily related in some fashion. And the ones that are related aren't necessarily the center of the whole thing. Um, Brian, you can move on to the next slide. Now, ontology combines all of these together uh, in essentially what Brian was talking about earlier, uh, making this big web of knowledge, which is connected and not connected. It has hierarchy, but it can also be decentralized. It is controlled by a certain amount of people who decide that this means this in this vocabulary. And the, although they can be updated, the idea is, is that this is simple enough that a computer can read it and complicated enough that a human can understand it. You can go to the next slide. So why do we develop ontologies outside of, or just organizing data for computers? Ultimately, ontologies are useful in reusing and sharing common knowledge, which might not be written down or um, given a, a set of rules um, very easily. Uh, we wanna make an idea uh, very explicit, especially when you're talking within a space where explicitness is necessary, such as organizing a library, uh, organizing patient records, making sure that particular knowledge is easily accessible in your database, uh, et cetera. And so we need to separate that domain knowledge from what's considered operational knowledge. Now, operational knowledge might be, uh, how do we build a float for a pride parade? But domain knowledge would really be focused on, well, why are we having a pride parade in the first place? What does that event mean? What is its structure? What are the different little individual bits involved? It's not really involved in the how we put things together. And that allows us to analyze domain knowledge on a bigger field. You know, can we say that there's a difference in health outcomes for doctors who write transsexualism in their notes versus those who write transgender? And that becomes a very interesting series of questions. Uh, next slide, Brian. So for gender, sex, and sexual orientation specifically, we have these large problems that have been coming up recently. I mean, they've been problems for a while, but for the very first time, they're hitting the news cycle about how should we ask people about their sexual orientation and gender identity in the US Census? Uh, should we ask them about their experiences through various surveys? How do we ask that? <laughs> I think you'll find that um, there are probably over 10,000 pages about how to talk about sexual orientation and gender identity data and surveys alone. Um, and that discussion, while fruitful, ultimately never got realized. Uh, there was nothing like that on the 2020 U.S. Census. It was rolled back. And we, we just really haven't had a good way to sit down and say, what is the population? And the Williams Institute has tried their darndest to put something together, which is how we get to the 3% of Americans or LGBTQ figure. But people don't really sit down and ask, well, what does that mean? Do we include intersex people? Some intersex people do not want to be classified as LGBTQ in any sense. Um, some asexual people identify or don't. Uh, I've had 
the bizarre meeting of a cisgender lesbian at one point who told me that she explicitly is not queer, is not LGBTQ at all. And I, it, it's an interesting conversation to have, but we have to have some form of controlled vocabulary because if you don't count these things, we really can't say whether or not discrimination is happening from a statistical point of view. And that's really important to understanding the health of any population. So ontologies allow us this system that can be easily updated. Next slide. So let's talk about the GSSO, which is the Gender, Sex, and Sexual Orientation Ontology that I've created uh, and its relationship to the Homosaurus. Next slide. So this ontology, we just released version 2.0. Um, the <laughs> basic website format is on the right here. Uh, and it can include something like 11,000 terms and 14,000 external database mappings. And we found that of the over 800 biomedical ontologies that currently exist, over 70% of our terms were covered in none of them. Uh, the, it just wasn't something that really occurred to doctors that they should worry about particular things. Uh, you'll find that probably a lot of these things are related to, for instance, um, symptoms of AIDS, uh, or various um, sexual terms, STIs, the differentiation between a sexually transmitted disease and a sexually transmitted infection is something that's often ignored and why those differing opinions exist. But ontologies are kind of, let's make it really slim, let's have basic suggestions, and let's not even try to touch anything that's related to minorities. Uh, and so that's why I developed the GSSO and really focused on including slang terms um, various pronouns and links out to their various usages and example sentences and other culturally specific and ethnicity specific gender identities. Um, I had a, recently a foster care um, situation where a physician was like, this kid set, tells me he, he's using poppers. What does that mean? <laughs> and it, he, he goes, you know, to various websites types it in in like BioPortal, which is the um, National Center for Biomedical Ontology Resource, and it's zero results uh, until the GSSO is uploaded. And you can finally figure out what the chemical name or the chemical class of poppers is and how it relates back to a particular um, component of the um, kid's uh, history. And in this uh, instance, people don't know this very often, but you can cause various problems to um, your eyes if you inhale too much too quickly. And it was very important for the doctor to know that there was a chemical basis for that. Next slide. So in terms of how we map the two together, this was a system I went about manually, which was essentially saying, I'm gonna create the GSSO and then look at every single thing that's in the homosaurus and make sure that they line up which is a pretty intensive task. Anybody who's done any sort of manual mapping in any, set, like in any sense, whether it be libraries, biomedical ontologies, et cetera, they're extremely time consuming processes. And oftentimes you have a lot of what if questions. Uh, we were finally able to do it. Uh, and of course there are some compromises. So some terms might be more specific or slightly less specific. And you have to have little relationships like broader synonym or narrower synonym, related synonym and other things to make sure that they're still human readable in the relationship. Um, and this means, Brian, you can go to the next slide, that if you put in a homosaurus term, it will immediately map to the GSSO term, which means that you can map to numerous other ontologies or vocabulary models, um, several of which are on the left here. Uh, and th this is really important, right? For We want to make sure that if you're using a system of anatomy and you have a particular um, type of uh, like sexual intercourse that's happening that may have caused some sort of symptom or may have been the result of something that you can easily relate the two concepts to one another. Um, I'm seeing this question right now. The software was or for creating ontologies. It's the de facto standard right now. It's probably, it's called Protege. Uh, and it's produced at the uh, at Stanford University, uh, where also where the NCBL is hosted. So there's a lot of interplay there. Uh, next slide, please. So the nice thing is, is that you can take any of these endpoints and put them into the search bar and it will immediately map you to where you wanna go within the GSSO, um, thanks to the homosources mapping. 
So intersex people will relate you back to intersex person or intersex from Wikipedia will return intersex. And as well, <laughs> the subject headings or Library of Congress classification or Dewey Decimal classification, any URL you put in here will map back, making these easily mappable to one another. Uh, next slide. So real quick, let's talk about natural language processing. Uh, next slide. So natural language processing is the use of machine learning, which is often referred to as artificial intelligence, even though I would argue machine learning is not that intelligent. Um, and we're really bringing together two disparate fields here of linguistics and computer science. Um, there's certainly an art to all of this. When you're constructing an ontology, you are making choices in addition to using any sort of um, process that might be automatic. And so NLP is really great with an ontology because you can easily summarize long documents. Um, in some cases, they've been used to identify the author of unknown documents by seeing how different speech patterns are used. Uh, you can find plagiarism. If you've ever used a plagiarism website, NLP is usually the source that's utilized for that. You can say, is this passage happy, sad, or um, there are more advanced sentiment models for this right now. Um, <laughs> um, and you can also do things like create chatbots or use autocomplete on your phone, which learns um, from your various habits. Uh, next slide. So essentially NLP boils down to this. We have to turn linguistic data into numbers because computers don't understand linguistic data. They don't know that the letter A and the letter B have a certain relationship to one another or that certain letters when arranged in a sentence make meaning. And so you have to turn those into numbers to kind of say, well, what is that meaning? And when Brian showed you the subject object predicate, that's one way of determining a meaning is by building a web between concepts where a connection is a one and a no connection is a zero. Or you rate the connection on a zero to 10, like a perfect synonym is a 10 and a near synonym is like an eight. You would do something like that. And that way you kind of build relationships between documents or between words. Uh, next slide. So within um, the gender, sex, and sexual orientation data we utilize, we use something called named entity recognition. And this is pretty common within ontologies. You might see NER used a lot. It's a buzzword in a certain sense because it just means that we're looking at text and we want to tag things that we've named. Now, oftentimes you'll see something like Google Maps will call um, San Francisco a named entity, um, but it might not call Taco Bell a named entity. Uh, if you have a list on Wikipedia that is a list of businesses, uh, the opposite will be true. And so it really depends on the type of situation you're in, what a named entity is. Uh, and so we can pick a specific concept that's in the GSSO, like transgender, and then we can ask questions. Should it include results for transsexual? Should it include results for transvestite? And that becomes a little spicy <laughs> within the field. So the original Christine Jorgensen paper, probably one of the most famous transgender people pre Caitlyn Jenner, um, the original paper referred to her as a transvestite, even though later in life, she um, utilized the term transgender. And so when we search trans or transgender, should we get that original paper is an interesting question. And so what we ended up doing within the GSSO is having smart date specific searching in options where you can map backwards for, to previously used terms or map forwards to newer terms with older terms. Uh, and uh, Brian, can you go to the next slide? Now, of course, these are options which are like little check boxes essentially because words are complicated. And a lot of times I'll see hierarchies like the one on, on our, the right here where there's this beautiful linear line between how we uh, think about modern identities, right? Like, oh, transsexual just changed into transgender and transvestite turned into transsexual. But that's not how it works and that's not how the system is. We have a lot of bias here in how we relate particular terms to one another. Should Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson appear in transgender results? Neither of them used the term, neither of them used the term transsexual, they referred to themselves as street queens. And so it becomes an interesting conversation where, in my opinion, I like to put the choice back on the user um, rather than make an ethical judgment and be like, these two terms are related to each other to a certain extent, 
and they changed over these time periods. But if you want to map back, you are making this set of assumptions. And there, of course, there's always going to be a recency bias there. Uh, and although I think it's important to make these options available, it's also important to take them with a grain of salt. Okay, next slide, Brian. So in terms of digitalizing archival collections, this sort of tagging is really great. You can go ahead and tag with the terms that are specific to that item and then go back. And if the person wants to find them by mapping backwards or mapping forwards, the user chooses that option. So sexual inversion might appear in the document itself, um, but you might not want that. You, you might think, okay, well, this is a very clear gay person here versus a, a very clear trans person here, which is already a very contentious judgment. Um, but you don't want to disinclude those results either. And so we leave that up to the user on the end to make that judgment. So the way that you tag these sort of things is you load them into your program. It will create an annotation report uh, and that can then be used to search within a larger database. And on average, if you're loading in an entire textbook, the GSSO will take anywhere between seven and 10 seconds to do this tagging. So if you want to go to the next slide, Brian. So this is an example if you want to use tagging within the uh, National Center for Biomedical Ontology's annotator platform. You might take a uh, basic abstract, you load it in, and it will give you these results, which are really great, um, and they do a lot. They, I only said, give me the GSSO results here, uh, and they'll give me the matched class, they'll give me the ontology at 10, et cetera, and the relationship. Brian, next slide. But the way the GSSO does this is a little bit clearer in that we're not really giving as much fluff. That's really nice for people who are um, into computers, but not as great for maybe if you're giving a sense of human readability. And so in the same abstract, we can go ahead and load it in. It will give us a much shorter um, list of terms that's more specific. And then every single one of those terms links out to a various like descriptor, um, alternate forms, abbreviations, references, if you're looking at external sources and that sort of thing. Um, this is like the spirit of Web 3.0 is not only making interoperability exist, but also putting some sort of ethical judgment onto the user and allowing them to make their own conclusions from here. Uh, apologies in advance, I do live pretty close to a hospital, so you might hear ambulances every so often. Uh, Brian, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So essentially, we want to go ahead and ask ourselves a few questions here. Before you do a search, before you tag an item, you want to look at like how is this group represented over time? And any sort of disclaimers that I've seen added to the beginning of queer documents uh, are very useful. And looking at if the current identification method we use, is it biased toward any sort of conclusion? Are we, are we leading the reader or the user to a conclusion prematurely? This makes it much more necessary to build linguistic chronologies and bibliographies, which an ontology allows us to do. You can say this person created this term in this year, and this term fell out of practice around this year, and we can see that in sort of a trend. And so the terms that replace one another become gray in this time zone. Uh, and we can go ahead and return that response to the user and be like, hey, we think these are great matches based on everything you've told us but these are less great and we can rank them based on those factors. And I think that's kind of how we can make historical resources and contemporary resources equally accessible uh, in a particular sense. Uh, next slide. So within the electronic health record, I've been working on this recently and uh, this is, will probably make up the bulk of the rest of my grad work and maybe the rest of my career. Um, we went ahead and looked at how um, international classification of disease codes are utilized within the electronic health record. Uh, and you'll often see if you're looking at uh, transgender resources and they come to these conclusions based solely on was transsexualism in the electronic health record. And that obviously introduces a bias. We're, we're gonna see mostly older physicians writing that. Uh, we're gonna see uh, non-passing transgender people written about more often in that sense than younger passing trans people. And so it automatically biases this set. ICD codes are used almost exclusively to bill people. And so if the reason for being at the hospital isn't directly transsexualism, 
then it's not going to be noted. And so a lot of the times it is noted, it's because of a link to suicidal ideation or depression, or in a lot of cases, sadly, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, uh, almost always unnecessarily. And so you're biasing any statistics you come out of with that data set uh, and over prioritizing those. So I looked at one particular data set in an emergency room, and this was something like 20,000 notes. Um, and we used basically, we manually looked over all of them to identify trans patients from the notes. And we basically found that once we ran back over NLP programs, that the ICD codes, the gold standard, was only correct 46% of the time. Doctors assigned the, like, they had a gender section, which was indicated within the database that this should only be used for sex assigned at birth, which is already complicated and not a good idea. But physicians only indicated the correct assigned sex at birth 54% of the time. And so if you were talking about should this person have a breast examination or do they need a prostate examination, you were already dealing with a, a huge problem. And this was in a very small data set in one particular hospital in a relatively liberal area. And so once you get into more rural situations, this becomes more and more important to make sure that we provide some sort of framework for this. Uh, Brian, next slide. Cool. So thank you awesome. so much. <laughs> um, I guess hopefully we ended early enough so we can take some questions here. I'm glad you appreciated my joke. <laughs> uh, that means a lot. We've had a few questions come through, um, but Meredith asked a question in chat and then she had to leave, but I'll go ahead and read her question to Brian um, and maybe she'll catch it in the recording. Uh, she said, noticing the British spelling such as LGBTQ older people's organizations used with an S, spelled with an S and neighborhoods with a U, um, are these part of the homosaurus? Right. Uh, um, the, the homosaurus is based on an older vocabulary that was developed um, at the IHLIA, which is um, the International Lesbian and Gay Library and Archive in the Netherlands. Um, so because it was based in, uh, based on an older Brit European vocabulary, and I believe when it got turned into linked data in the mid-aughts, and I can double check with KJ Rossing because he was involved with this, um, I believe it was carried over with British spelling. So British spelling is the preferred spelling, um, but if you actually go into the homosaurus vocabulary, it does have the alternative spelling with the American English. So either one will work just fine. Um, and Alexandra is, asks uh, in the Q&A, I love the concept of letting the user decide what synonyms to include forward or backward in time. What does that look like in the user interface? Um, that's a great question. So right now it's a simple checkbox in an advanced settings. Uh, and so the user simply clicks map backwards or map forwards. Uh, and it has like a little, um, uh, like one of the eyes and a circle that you can hover over and it'll explain what that means. And then there's a link out to another page kind of explaining the exact methodology. Um, you could make it more complicated, but I found that it's been more useful for the users in a small focus group that we had. Okay. Um, and Sarah was asking again, I, I, you may have answered this, I think you did, Claire, but what software did you use to construct the vocabulary? Yeah, I did talk briefly about that, but I honestly, I can't stress enough that Stanford University is the center of the world in terms of biomedical ontologies, and they do everything. Um, Protégé is the de facto industry standard right now, industry in quotes, when you're talking about academia. Um, it's I find it a highly intuitive interface and you can open up all of the GSSO files or even if you download the Homosaurus as a JSON file, it will open up nicely and cleanly and you can go through the whole thing on your own laptop um, from the flat files. But I will say for some people, there are definitely some advanced features within there that can be a little daunting at times. Yeah, I would say to just the learning how to use Protege, they do have this um, fun little 
this tutorial. Um, and if you've ever used this, you know exactly where I'm going. It, it's uh, how do you make a pizza? And it, it talk, walks you through like, oh, I want cheese pizza or pepperoni pizza. Okay, so th this type of pizza can only have cheese and this type of pizza can only have pepperoni. So it walks you through kind of creating your own ontology. It is, is, is a fun practice. It does help you think through some of these more advanced concepts in a, a more entertaining way. Okay. Um, the next question was, what is the current URL for the GSSO? Or were those mock-up images are currently available on BioPortal? And the um, address that she's asking about is homepages.uc.edu. <laughs> uh, right. So um, that was our mock-up URL up until COVID. Um, so unfortunately, we lost the uh, tech capabilities to keep that URL live which was uh, very sad. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and attempt to add in the main chat, if that's all right. If I click all panelists and attendees, that'll work, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. It should work. Uh, so we have a, a BioPortal link, um, which is a public beta, and you can explore within the entity column, which I, I will make sure to write here. Um, and then there's also a, um, a, uh, a GitHub page, which I'm doing all of the new commits up there. And there's also an issues section there. So I have that open. Um, if people have found particular issues, if something's spelled wrong, et cetera, I'm one person <laughs> going over 11,000 terms. So there are the occasional spelling errors or whatnot, I will admit that. Um, but the easiest thing to do is to download one of the OWL files and then to open it within the protege platform because there are certain limitations to BioPortal specifically. So there are differentiations between individuals and classes within ontologies and BioPortal currently only allows you to look at um, classes within its system. So. Um, I'm going to put the protege link here as well. Um, cool. So can everybody in chat see that? Um, cool. Uh, yeah, so we are planning on a general website launch, and the image that I showed is a mock-up. We're, we're still in testing right now, mainly because uh, within a smaller focus group, it wasn't performing fast enough. And that's always <laughs> the issue, is you want to make it as fast as possible. Uh, and so I'm... I'm waiting to release it until I feel absolutely confident that um, the usability will be up to speed. So right now, the best way to access is through Protege. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. <laughs> um, and Gozi would like to know, please discuss more on the management of likely change of terms in linked data vocabulary or ontologies. Yeah, so I feel like I can talk a little bit about this, but I'm not positive of the exact connotation here. So please correct me in chat if I'm wrong. So when you're saying change of terms, do you mean updates to the ontology or shifts? Or do you mean um, relating a term like transgender back to transsexual? Um, because in the first case, uh, usually an ontology has a board of directors, but I'd like to decentralize a little bit more. And although I do have people that I'm talking to are more knowledgeable in the field, I also have a very open and very public issue section that I've been communicating about to make sure more colloquial terms are included. Um, oh, shoot. <laughs> Sorry if the GitHub link wasn't working. Um, but yes, so um, in terms of how previous and backwards terms relate to one another, uh, you basically essentially add a um, replaced by or ha is replaced by um, annotation. Uh, and then that annotation has a certain amount of um, metadata associated with it. So I might use a date field or start date and end date field or a, um, a gray date or a, an end gray date sort of field. And the computer understands what that means when we're loading it into a search interface and then the search will um, respond with, oh, this is an 80% match and this is a 95% match or et cetera, based on those criteria. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> and I'll I'll just add on to say um, with linked data vocabulary specifically with homosexual specifically, um, it's not it's it's about because it's a community run effort. It's more about when these trends are proposed or when people raise them. It's about having that discussion and 
I think we would be the first to admit that there are limitations to our board. We are we are very white. We are very um, European and American. Um, we do carry we do cover a variety of experience within that range, um, and we do work very hard to try to correct our limitations. But we are absolutely open to um, especially non-white and non-European or American perspectives. And if you're interested, please get in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk more about it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, the next question is um, from Vinit, and I, I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. Um, I'm, I'm very sensitive to that, but I make apologies if I mispronounce names. Um, I have a question regarding case study on digital libraries. Do you also annotate the user queries or just the documents are annotated? Um, so I'm gonna assume that that question is directed at me, uh, if that's okay, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of annotating a user query, um, that process is very different from annotating um, a, a document. So um, if you're annotating a user query, there's definitely a, I'm searching this and I wanna return results for synonyms, or I'm searching this and I wanna return results for is replaced by. And those are options that are given. Um, but <laughs> uh, at this point, um, it, it, it's very different to annotate a single word than a whole document. You can learn a lot more from an entire document, when it was created, who created it, um, where it was created, and that metadata provide um, a much different scope than a single word in a user query. And so I, I hesitate to say if we're annotating a user query as in one word. Um, we're mapping it as to the best that we can, um, but I, I don't know if I would call that necessarily um, uh, annotating. Uh, in terms of the documenting of the NLP processes, uh, once we're uploading the website, all of the code will be added as well. Uh, and there will be, uh, that will be open source and can be used as you please. If you're downloading on your own platform, you can run it outside of running it on the website. So it's going to be completely free. <laughs> um, but the main process uh, is essentially basic NLP. Um, we have a, an exact feature where we're only returning exact matches, an approximate feature, which is very much, does this sub um, string exist anywhere? And then there's a fuzzy search feature, um, which is default at 70%, which if you know anything about NLP, or even if you don't, I highly recommend looking up fuzzy searching because that's how Google and other systems do that. Um, I found personally that I think the approximate data searching works the best within my platform, um, but I'm experimenting on how to make the fuzzy searching better to facilitate um, more comprehensive NLP. Great question. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Susan. She says, I really enjoyed this paper and the work you're doing is very impressive. Is there documentation of the NLP process you're using to create the annotations? And oh. Christine seconded that and she said she'd love to hear more about what you've gotten out of using word vectors especially. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I guess I kind of inadvertently answered that question, hopefully. Um, and I'm definitely up for hearing any critiques on that answer specifically. Um, but in terms of, uh, what was the word vectors question again? Um, she said, um, let me get back to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, oh, there's an answered section. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, she said she, uh, I'd love to hear more about what you've gotten out of using word vectors. Yeah. Um, so. I'm going to assume here that we're talking about the vectorization of individual words. And I will say that the data quality have heavily affects that. So uh, in an electronic health record, you are having people type in words directly versus with the AIDS history project research with the memory lives on data sources. Those were read in as PDFs using OCR. And then that OCR was corrected using uh, a Python package word ninja, which I, I heavily like, uh, recommend and it's a great program, but it, it's only about 70% accurate. Uh, and so in terms of vectorizing, you have to be really careful there with, do we use the OCR text? Do we use the correct text? Do we need to have somebody manually go over this and correct it? And uh, there's 
still really not a perfect answer to that, but that's definitely going to affect how um, the vectorizer works. And for the current platform, the vectorization that we use is usually um, you try to match the original, then you try to match it without punctuation uh, by separating sentences or separating clauses. And then you try another match after sending everything to lowercase. And of course there are issues with all of those things and every time you vectorize words, you are losing information. Uh, and it's important to keep that in mind. We try to recommend using the original data set as much as possible. It, it's important that San Francisco is capitalized <laughs> when you're matching. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> Okay. Um, and then there was a question in the chat about has has from Adam Schiff about has a property in Wikidata been created for the GSSO? Uh, not as of yet. Okay. There is a there's a full mapping from the GSSO to Wikidata. So if you have a Wikidata URL, you can put it into the GSSO and it will map. But there is not a mapping from Wikidata to the GSSO as of yet. Um, I used to be a really active user on Wikidata, and they sort of have a thing or they don't like the original creator of an ontology or vocabulary advocating for their own and adding it themselves. So if you would like to add it, I <laughs> fully support you, but unfortunately, uh, I, 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 ethically, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> okay, and then we have a question that Brian would like to answer, so I'll, I'll turn it over to him and let him ask and answer. Um, would you, I, I have just a question for Bethany. Um, what do you both think about the committee to consider or approve or deny a proposal for subject headings that classification such as drag queens? Or another example is refusal to change offensive heading by the committee like alien or intentional. I wonder which committee you mean. Hmm. Anyways, um, we've actually been told the reason that these won't be changed for now is that it boils down to quote, too much work, too few people to work on these problems. I absolutely, this is one of the main reasons I am interested in this and um, there is a lot of interesting work being done around this, uh, specifically Julia Hardesty. Uh, I don't know if she's in the, in the chat today, but she um, is working on this really fascinating way to almost overwrite the um, Library of Congress subject headings with homo source terms. And there are other ways um, I've been thinking about that we could possibly use multiple different vocabularies um, if the Brian Deere system, uh, classification system is made like data, that could also be used to overwrite um, harmful indigenous and Native American terms. So um, that's one of the real big advantages and attractions and the possibilities I see of LCS, uh, sorry, linked data is this ability to have a community that so strongly supports it or works on it um, and have that, I, I feel that is a more ethical approach than necessarily depend, being dependent on LCSH. And if you had anything you want to add to that, Claire? Uh, no, I think I think you did a great job of answering that. <laughs> okay, and Brian, I'll let you answer the the other question as well. This is from Bradley Carrington. Um, this presentation made me think about history of terms, use, and changes in meaning. Maybe it would make sense for helpful scope notes and LCSH records. Yes, but LCSH needs a lot more work, a lot more people. Um, the Oxford the OED seems to have a good amount of historical quotation sharing the change in meaning, sense of return, and chronological order. Um, I also thought of this as a potential PhD project, but I am both afraid and glad to have been preempted by Melissa Adler, who is working on this. Um, right now, I believe she is working on actually tracing every single term in LCSH from the past to the present, starting with Thomas Jefferson's library. Um, I don't know how far along she's in the work. I just know it's an ongoing project of hers and I really recommend um, you get in touch with her and buy and read her book, Cruising the Catalog, because it, it, it's just a, a really fantastic read. Okay. Um, oh. I just want to say shout out to Bob Kovaski. Claire, uh, GSSO has just been added to the Wikidata. <laughs> So no, that that's the homosaurus. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. there we go. Thank you, Bob, so much. But thank you. <laughs> okay, um, and we have a participant who has her hand raised. Um, so I'm going to uh, unmute her and and let her ask her question. Jeanette. Okay, she may be having audio problems. 
I think those are all of the questions at the moment. Yeah, I can definitely, if anybody's interested in anything, Brian and I can put our emails into the chat as well if you have specific questions that um, we didn't get to answer in here. Uh, there was also I'm, the follow-up. Oh, sorry. I'm just picking up friendly, uh, a question oh. from Alexander Lee Provo. Hi, Alex. Um, do you use Ghost in the GSS? Oh, my sorry, status, but the GSS I have. Um, so, that's an interesting question. So my, my, my basis is not as a, um, a library or a librarian or a library scientist. Uh, and so my um, conceptualizations of things might be slightly different than um, some others. It, to my knowledge, because the, um, the GSSO builds on top of the basic formal ontology and several other, I believe, scope-based ontologies, there should be interoperability, but I also might be completely off base here. And maybe if Brian wants to correct me here, if that means something different than I think it does. Um, in that case. Um, also, whoever just created, oh, Christine, thank you so much for creating. <laughs> I very much appreciate that. That means a lot. Uh, the beauty of Real-time editing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we had another question from Susan, and I was kind of wondering about this as well. Um, I find it fascinating that this work is happening in part in the biomedical context, and I understand the importance of an emphasis on sex in this context. Do you find a tension between the GSSO, which I take is geared towards the biomedical domains, and the Homosaurus project with I take it is more in general, in terms of emphasis on sex as opposed to emphasis on gender. Um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, within my limited expertise within the field, I don't have an MD, but I've had several discussions with clinicians here. There is a lot of move away from using terms like sex or biological sex because they're not necessarily specific enough. Um, you might hear somebody make a snap judgment on somebody based on their phenotypic appearance, um, but that's often not enough without context, right? And if I say anatomical sex, do I mean primary sex characteristics? Do I mean secondary sex characteristics? Do I mean genetic sex? Do I mean um, any other particular type of sex relationship? And so um, within the GSSO, we, we definitely are use more specific terms. There are plenty of scope notes where it's like, hey, are you thinking about using sex? Hey, are you thinking about using the term biological sex? Consider these like 12 more specific terms before you use this, please. Uh, and we often have that conversation a lot when it comes to translational research because bench biologists love using the word gender <laughs> when they do not mean gender. Uh, and so that that's definitely something that uh, has been a conflict just in general. But with the homosaurus specifically, um, I tend to lean towards very, like if there's a clinical term and there's a colloquial term, my training is, hey, let's use, you know, let's use amyl nitrites instead of poppers. <laughs> um, because people know what that means within uh, the biomedical domain. Uh, and so Homosaurus's main heading is poppers because people who are searching for it in a library are going to search for that far before they'll search for amyl nitrates. Whereas the main heading in the GSSO is amyl nitrate or nitrites. But the, if you search poppers, that same heading will come up. Mm -hmm. So um, it's definitely just been a, well, what do we decide is the main heading issue most of the time? And <laughs> I'm sure Brian will tell you there have been times in the editorial board where I'm like, let's use this very fancy term. And everybody's like, <laughs> not the point. <laughs> <laughs> we've, never, so, we've never heard that before. <laughs> we have our occasional, um, but I think that's important, right? I yeah. think it's, it's important to include multiple perspectives here. And just because a doctor uses the term doesn't necessarily make it right. And, and was, that, that's been something I've been trying to focus on. And I'll say for the home research specifically, um, this is a, a very slow moving process because we only meet once a month and that's not a critique at all because that's all we have time for. But 
I, we are working more specifically to broaden um, some of the categories that address. So we've already worked on adding um, relationship orientations um, and terms such um, like allo, normativity and asexuality are more common. We're, we're working more on adding um, other types of orientation, relationship orientation, um, relationship preference, such as monogamy and polyamory or polygamy. So um, we're, we're trying to branch out to other areas that the LCSH probably generally will never color. Um, another term, another area that's completely unexplored is um, BDSM terms and terminology, which I don't foresee the LCSH ever coming, which is unfortunate because it's a very disciplinary vocabulary. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Um, I've been trying to also keep an eye on chat. I don't see any more questions. Do y'all have any closing thoughts? This has been a very fascinating uh, presentation, very enjoyable. Okay, um, oh. Alex has a question. Oh, yes, um, so I'm looking at that right now. Uh, so for some terms, we uploaded these sort of relationships, but they aren't available for all terms right now. Uh, and that was based mostly on the fact that I'm an individual grad student <laughs> looking over 11,000 um, different uh, entries. So if there are particular dates of note that you would like to add for something or think needs to be added for something, um, those are uh, currently in the process of being built out. Um, they're really easy for like this term was coined at this date. They're a little harder for the gray areas. Um, and so um, we're working on that moving forward. Thank Great you question. All so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having us. Very much appreciate all of the questions and feedback. It's it's really important. <laughs> Well, thank you for a great presentation. Both you and Brian are doing great work in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. All right. Thank you for attending, everybody.